coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. Get whatever vaccine is available to you. These are highly effective vaccines. They are safe vaccines insofar as we can tell after 100 million doses. And this is how we're going to get out of this situation. But even with the rapidly expanding vaccine rollout, the U.S. could still see a surge of COVID cases this spring. I think most of us expect a major surge because of spring break travel and the concomitant relaxation of restrictions and the sort of COVID fatigue that all of us do feel in one way or another. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. We're recording this podcast on Monday, March the 22nd, 2021. Spring is here. Even in Minnesota, it was warm this weekend. <laughs> and now many people are getting vaccinated and life is kind of getting back to a new normal. Well, Dr. Greg Poland, virologist and infectious disease expert at Mayo Clinic, is here to discuss this with us today, along with ongoing uh, topics about COVID-19. Thanks for being here, Greg. Yes, good to be here and happy springtime. Yes, it's wonderful. It feels like spring. I may be a little premature saying that, but the, the calendar says we're yeah. Right. yeah. You never know what's going to happen in Minnesota. Though. <laughs> Say, Greg, catch us up on um, the vaccine, the vaccination rates in the United States. You know, we're doing surprisingly well. You know, the, the goal set by the new administration was 100 million doses in 100 days. I think they've already surpassed that. That's amazing. We are at a, yeah, we're at a point now where 17% of U.S. adults are fully vaccinated 40% of those who are 65 or older are fully vaccinated. 40% of people over the age of 65. And many states now are beginning with this increased supply to open up and minimize any you know, restrictions. So this is a very, very good sign. Well, speaking of opening up and minimizing restrictions, I'm seeing all kinds of articles and news reports about spring break. Apparently, it is spring break time in America, and many um, are gathering on the beaches. So tell us how this might might affect uh, things going forward. Do we expect surges? Are we concerned about variants? What yeah, do you think uh, about yeah, this? Very, very concerned about variants, particularly the so-called B117 or UK uh, variant, also called the Kent variant probably 30 to 50 percent more transmissible and infectious. So I think most of us expect a major surge because of spring break travel and the concomitant relaxation of restrictions and the sort of COVID fatigue that all of us do feel in one way or another. That combination is not a good combination. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're going to see a fourth surge now. Uh, we've done this over and over where we see a plateau, relax restrictions, only to have a higher surge than before. And this time it's with a variant of more concern. I have a question about vaccinations and um, pregnant women. Yeah. Some reports that uh, if someone receives a vaccine during pregnancy, that they are able to pass on immunity to COVID-19 to uh, newborns. Yeah, this is a, a piece of uh, good news. Uh, there's uh, just a case report pending. This is one pregnant woman who got one dose. I think it was the Moderna vaccine. And then uh, within three weeks or so delivered her baby. So she got one dose prior to delivery. And that baby did have antibodies, low level, but nonetheless antibodies, which suggests that that can be transferred from mother to child and therefore protect that child uh, in those early months before they might uh, have an opportunity to eventually get um, uh, immunized. We also know that it can be uh, passed in breast milk too, which is another advantage. So we need more data on this, more mothers to be studied, but at least in this one case, it could be demonstrated. That is really interesting, Greg, because we have had so many questions about whether someone should receive the vaccine during pregnancy. And we have also talked about the fact that sometimes immunizations 
uh, are not effective in very, very, the very, very young because no. of their inability to form antibodies. So an no. interesting uh, protective strategy. Yeah. Right? And, uh, you know, we do that with uh, pertussis. We do this with influenza. Um, and, and I think you're exactly right. Now, the manufacturers are planning studies down to somewhere between two months and six months of age. So we'll, we'll know more and more. And there's a, there's a large study going on now of vaccine in pregnant women. So again, we'll have more and more data involving thousands and tens of thousands rather than small groups of numbers. Greg, peripheral neuropathy or nerve type of pain, particularly in the feet, sometimes in, in the hands, but usually in the very distal parts, the, the, um, the ends of our feet or and toes or hands, uh, soles of feet sometimes can be affected by this, these type of nerve pains called peripheral neuropathies. Yeah. Is there any um, connection between those or concern uh, with those type of disorders and COVID-19 vaccinations? Yeah, certainly, you know, I've heard anecdotal reports from patients and uh, in the media but uh, honestly, when you look at the clinical trial data and you look at VAERS reports, so safety reporting, nothing has uh, shown up yet in terms of any kind of peripheral neuropathy in association with the vaccine. And, you know, we're over 100 million doses uh, then. So, you know, you, you never know whether you could be in a situation where somebody has a neuropathy or a predisposition they get a vaccine that could be, you know, it does stimulate an immune and inflammatory response. Could they have some transient symptoms that resolve on their own? Certainly possible. Have we seen cases that uh, where they had no such symptoms, got a vaccine, developed this, and uh, had no predisposing factors, and they continue to have it? No. Very interesting. Okay, here's a question that could concern many of us, including our listeners who like to have a glass of wine at night uh, or once in a while. Um, is it okay to drink alcohol between doses of the COVID vaccines? Yeah, you know, I, I think we don't have any concern here with, um, d dare I say, reasonable use. Now, now, what do I mean by that? Certainly somebody who is overusing or abusing alcohol uh, what we would call alcoholism or an alcohol use disorder, those individuals do have compromised immune systems because of end organ damage that occurs. But if you wanted to have a glass of red wine with your cheese and crackers uh, in the afternoon or your dinner, no issue whatsoever uh, in that. It is not going to affect the immune response. Well, I am very glad to hear you say that, Greg. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so it isn't a problem with the alcohol itself, necessarily having a glass of wine. It's the effects of um, alcohol. The longer term effects the or of overuse. Yes. That makes sense. Um, tell us about Moderna and what they are working on in terms of the next generation of vaccines. Yeah, so what Moderna is doing, and you know, we, let me just define here when we talk about next generation vaccines, these are, any, these are any of the next cycle of vaccines. So Moderna has uh, several different next generation vaccines. One uh, is being developed in regard, as many of the manufacturers are, in regard to the variant viruses that are arising. The particular one that you're hearing about, which is called the Moderna mRNA-1283, is a vaccine being developed to be refrigerator stable. Right now, it has to be kept in a freezer and has a limited you know, time that it can be out of a freezer. So they're working on uh, cold stability. But the other interesting thing they're looking at when they do this phase one study is they're going to look at the current 100 microgram dose as one dose versus two dose and compare that to a 10, 30, and 100 microgram dose, which, you know, if that turned out to be possible, you have now, let's say you have the 10 uh, a microgram dose. You have now expanded the vaccine supply with that vaccine tenfold. Yes, um, wow. which is which is really important because one thing that's important. Yes, we need to protect uh, everybody in our country, 
but everybody in every country needs to be protected. And so you may have heard, in fact, the U.S. is going to um, uh, sell some of its vaccine, maybe even donate, I can't remember which one, to Mexico and Canada. Oh, where I they've, had, they've had a tighter vaccine supply. Well, that's, that's fantastic because there's a lot of movement you know, across borders. So the sooner the world is vaccinated, uh, we will, as they say, you are now free to move around the country. <laughs> That's right. We're all looking forward to that a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move to just a little different topic, but one I've been a little bit curious about myself and, and wondered what you think. In the beginning, there had been a lot of talk about this contact tracing. So in other words, uh, if someone... <clears throat> was positive for COVID-19 or became ill, that they would um, contact the contacts of that person um, to, to see if they would need to be tested or to kind of follow how the virus was moving, I think, within the population partly too. And now there were so many people with COVID-19 that it almost became impossible, I'm sure, to track. Do you think that will become important again yeah. Um, as we talk about the variants. Yeah, good, 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 good question, Helena. I mean, you're right that uh, the contact tracing was just very quickly overwhelmed other than in small local situations. You know, we're at a stage now where about one out of every 10 uh, or so Americans has been infected. Uh, we have lost about one out of every 590 Americans to COVID. So, I mean, this is an unprecedented tragedy in our, in our lifetimes. I, I think when and if we can get this dampened down low, then we will revert to more intensive contact tracing because as you're trying to get rid of the last cases, you know, you have to be concerned of, over what we know now maybe 40 to 50% or more of cases are transmitted asymptomatically. In other words, you sit down on an airplane next to somebody, you don't know that they have it, they don't know that they have it, and then they go and mix and mingle and you're in close proximity for several hours. That, that's how things like this uh, happen. Similarly, we are beginning to reopen schools and decrease the distancing. Uh, requirement in the face of more transmissible variants. So uh, I think we will see more contact tracing as resources allow it. Greg, this next question comes from me overhearing conversations, uh, casual <laughs> conversations, and got me to thinking. Um, there was There's a lot of question about Will COVID become endemic? Is it mm. going to be something that we face every year, like uh, the flu, for instance? And will we need to be vaccinated every year? You know, this is an interesting study uh, or question. Let me tell you about one study that just came out of uh, Denmark. They looked as long as seven or eight months after somebody had gotten infected and said, what is your protection in that time interval against reinfection. So you were infected, seven, eight months goes by, what level of protection do you have against reinfection? If you were under the age of 65, you were about 80% protected. That's pretty good. Now this is interesting because people think that they are protected forever and clearly they're not. If you were over the age of 65, that level of protection fell to 47%. So it is clear that people who have had infection can get reinfected. So that's one important um, point. The second point is that we know with seasonal coronaviruses that people do repetitively get infected. So my guess is that what the virus is learning to do by uh, infecting one after another of us and mutating is that it is learning to be much more highly transmissible and likely then will evolve into something that is more akin to an endemic virus, much like influenza, where, and I don't know whether it'll be every year, every two years, something like that, we may well be re-immunizing. That's fascinating, and yeah. it makes me wish this virus wasn't so smart. Oh, I know. I mean, we're, we're, we are literally watching in real time viral evolution happening, and it, it is born of just 
unchecked transmission through the population. I mean, it really is, this is, this is a factor of human behavior as much as it is viral behavior. This whole year has been fascinating. And just imagine how much people have learned about viruses that they never yeah. thought they would, they never thought they would know or need to know. <laughs> they, they, most people never heard of PPE, right? That's <laughs> no, right. That's right. <laughs> well, thanks, Greg. Do you have any last words of wisdom to share with us? You today? know, uh, somewhat akin to things that we've said, uh, when you have access to a vaccine and, and very soon, basically every American adult is going to have access. Get whatever vaccine is available to you. These are highly effective vaccines. They are safe vaccines insofar as we can tell after 100 million doses of, of giving them. And this is how, this is how we're going to get out of this situation. And hopefully before worse variants develop. So when we don't get vaccinated, when we don't practice hand space and space, we are allowing the virus to get worse in terms of its effect on human health. So this is really, really important. And we have to all work together to, you know, uh, smash the misinformation, the disinformation that occurs and which is hurting, harming people. I'm really glad you mentioned that, Greg, because we've had concern here, even um, Mayo Clinic has Moderna, yeah. Pfizer, Johnson & Johnson, and some of the employees have wondered, well, could I pick which vaccine I wanted, oh. or am I getting something lesser if I have to get a vaccine that others didn't get? And I, I love to hear you say, get the vaccine that you can get. Yeah, absolutely. Remember that all three vaccines that we have in the U.S., are essentially 100% protective against death, hospitalization, and severe disease. It gets lesser when you go down to moderate or mild disease, and we care about that, but the first thing is we don't want you to be hospitalized, we don't want you to die as a result, and these vaccines are better than any other vaccines we have in preventing that. I had read a an article with the CEO of Pfizer saying, get whatever vaccine you can get. Yeah. And I thought, well, isn't that telling? He's not trying to sell a vaccine. We're trying to get the population vaccinated. Yeah. This is this is human health. You know, at, at one level, it boils down to, uh, would, would, you, would you barrel down the highway without seat belts, good tires, brakes, and airbags? No. No. Why, why would you do it? with a virus like this that is so widespread. Hands, face, space, and vaccinate. And vaccinate. <laughs> it was that last one we had to take on. <laughs> thanks so much for being here, Greg. My pleasure. Our thanks again to Dr. Greg Poland, virologist, vaccine expert, infectious disease expert at the Mayo Clinic for being with us here again today. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish you all a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.